Hello, my dear. Story one. I threw out my son's teddy bear and now he's different. About a month ago, my five-year-old son Luke became obsessed with an old teddy bear. It was falling apart. One eye missing, stuffing leaking out, but he refused to let it go. He called it Mr. Bear, though he never named it before. My wife and I decided to throw it away while Luke slept. The next morning, he woke up frantic. Where's Mr. Bear? He screamed, terrified. It wasn't just a normal tantrum. Luke was pale, shaking, like something terrible had happened. He kept saying, I have to find him. He'll be mad at me. That night, things escalated. Luke didn't sleep. He started whispering to someone, pointing at the closet, saying, He's here. I found him wide-eyed and sweating, clutching the bear's old ribbon. I know I threw that bear away, but the ribbon was back, dirty and frayed, wrapped tight around his little hands. I tried to take it, but Luke screamed, Don't. He's watching. Later that night, I woke up to scratching. I thought it was the wind, but the sound was coming from under my bed. I leaned over, heart pounding, and saw a hand, long, pale fingers with jagged nails, reaching out from beneath the bed. Before I could move, it grabbed my ankle, ice cold and sharp. I've never felt anything so cold in my life, at least not anything living. I yanked free, pulling Luke into my arms. Clutching each other's hands, we ran for the door, but as we reached it, something slammed against it from the other side hard. The door rattled, deep breathing echoed through the room, and claws scraped against the wood. There was something so intense about the scratching, like whatever was doing it would stop at nothing until it broke through. I turned to Luke, but he wasn't scared anymore. His face was blank. You shouldn't have thrown him away, he whispered. The scratching stopped. I finally opened the door, pulling Luke out of the room. We stayed in the living room that night. I didn't sleep. The house was quiet, but I could still feel it, him watching. The next morning, Luke was different. He just sat in his room, holding the bear's ribbon. His voice was barely a whisper. I'm sorry, I'll bring him back. And then I noticed it, dark, wet dirt, scattered across the floor, leading from the bed to the closet. Luke looked up at me, his eyes dark, hollow. He squeezed the ribbon tightly in his fist. You can't stop him, he said, his voice cold. Mr. Bear's coming for you. I'm writing this from my study. The house is quiet now, too quiet. Luke hasn't made a sound in hours, and I'm too scared to check on him. The ribbon, dirt, the hand, I can still feel the cold grip on my ankle. I've locked myself in here, hoping it'll be enough, but deep down, I know it won't be. The scratching has started again. Faint at first, but it's growing louder. I hear it coming from under the door, and I know what's next. There's no escape. I threw him away, and now he's coming for me. Story 2. Mindy's Playhouse. When I was around six or seven, maybe even eight, I had a next-door neighbor called Mindy. I had moved to a small town just north of El Dorado, Kansas, and was waiting for the new school year to start. Mindy was my age, and on one warm summer morning, she'd knocked on our door to ask if I would like to come over and play. She said she'd seen me moving in, and was delighted that another little girl had moved in on the street. She'd wanted to be my friend. After my parents' divorce, I had moved in with my dad. He was a quiet, meek man, who didn't do much but garden and watch old reruns of All in the Family. My mom lost custody because of her drug abuse, and I suppose that he hadn't really known what to do with me when I'd first moved in. I hadn't lived with him in my formative years, and it was only once my grandmother got wind of things that he'd pushed to be a part of my life again, having been disillusioned that I was living in some stately house up north. I think, in the beginning at least, he wasn't prepared to start raising up a little girl, particularly one he'd last seen as a toddler, and so the option of letting me play with the girl from the nice family next door must have been a relief. A way for him to get his life in order to step in as the dad he needed to be. And I'm grateful to say that he really, truly did. Mindy was a bit spoilt, but a good kid. From what I recall, she had long, blonde hair that her mother always tied into pigtails, and a sweet, chocolate box pretty face. Like Shirley Temple. 
I'm afraid there aren't many more details I can give on her appearance. My memory is hazy. Even when I try my best to recall her face, all I can see is a blur, but that initial feeling, that impression, still remains. She always wore the nicest clothes, and despite my reserved jealousy that she and I were not cut from the same cloth, she nevertheless tried her best to make me feel like her equal. She'd ask her mother to teach us how to bake, and her father would always let us stay up late to watch television. She'd give me her old dresses and shoes so that I'd have nice things to wear for the first day of school, which seemed to be an eternity away at that age. Although we only ever knew each other for several weeks, her memory is something I would never forget. I can't forget it. The best thing about Mindy's home was a little playhouse she had, tucked right at the end of the backyard. It was big enough for the two of us to be in, but any adult would have a hard time bending down and minding their head on the doorframe. Her grandfather had built it for her when she was just a baby, and it was truly a gorgeous thing. Cream painted wood with a coral pinkish roof, clad with real tiles. Painted ivy and roses adorned the outdoors, and the duck egg green door held a sweet, heart-shaped doorknob. The windows had proper glass and matching green shutters on the outside. Inside were two wooden stools and a toy box filled with make-believe kitchenware. A faux stove, completely covered with painted appliances, and a rocking horse in the corner. Floral curtains to draw out the light. It was every little girl's dream. And Mindy let it be mine as much as it was hers. Ours. Sometimes we'd have sleepovers in there. The door had a hatch key lock on the inside so it felt like we really were adults, pretending to be roommates in our own grown-up apartment, telling each other stories over make-believe tea, and leaving the curtains open to star at the stars in the sky. The warm, summer nights left us comfortable in our sleeping bags, and I truly thought I'd never be happier. My therapist says trauma can hide a lot of things from you. It's a tricky thing leaving you with the dread and anxiety without ever revealing the extent of it all. I suppose PTSD is the phrase I should be using. My fond memories of Mindy's house are still there, untouched, untainted. Maybe my own childhood experiences with my mom didn't allow me to realize the cracks that were forming in Mindy's home. I never thought Mr. Howard was a bad man. He was nice and looked all cleaned up. He had a white-collar job, and I never considered that, with his income, he shouldn't have been living in our rundown neighborhood, let alone be my next door neighbor. He always came home from work with a smile on his face and a kiss for his wife, and treated me as he treated Mindy. In my eyes, they were the perfect nuclear family. Compared to just me and my dad, who, bless his heart, was trying to make ends meet, they seemed so comfortable, so cozy. It was only years after that I'd come to understand the length some people will go to keep up a facade. What I had perceived as a healthy, happy lifestyle was nothing more than a perfectly practiced production. A play put on a stage where the actors couldn't leave. They couldn't stop playing pretend, as Mindy and I had done so many times in her playhouse. The real playhouse was their own home, and despite their food and water and appliances all being very real, they'd manufactured themselves to be nothing more than puppets on a stage. Marionettes controlled by the overwhelming desire to not let a tear slip or issue be revealed. A waltz of souls tethered to an unattainable dream. Mr. Howard was a gambler. His savings whittled away down to mere pennies in his pockets. But he never stopped his grandiose spending. Mindy always got a new gift whenever he went away for business. And Mrs. Howard was always presented with some fabulous flowers. Sometimes... She'd send me home with her bouquet, telling me that she'd not need them with all the wonderful flowers he'd bought her before. She'd seen my dad gardening on the small, shameful plot of land we called a garden, and he'd always been grateful to try and plant them back there. It really was strange how it happened. Mr. Howard, despite all his flaws, loved his family. He loved them so much, but perhaps love confused him. It was only a few weeks before school when Mindy invited me around for a sleepover. It was the usual routine. Her mother made a fantastic meal, and we stayed up a bit to watch the television, laughing at whatever risque scene was portrayed past 9 p.m. Then, around 10 p.m., her mother ushered up to get ready for bed, 
having set up our little camp in the playhouse outside. It was all the same, the same old passage of events. Mindy and I were tucked away in the playhouse, and as we grew sleepy from chatting about God knows what, we heard a large bang. Mindy shot up and looked concerned. I was extremely tired, and whilst rubbing my eyes, I asked her what the matter was. She didn't speak, but put a finger to her mouth, beckoning me to stay quiet. She said she'd go in and see what was happening. She left and then whispered a final few words. Lock the door, Kelly. Don't let me in unless I say the password. Promise. I did as she said and waited. Then, screaming. There's not much else to remember from that. My dad said that I refused to come out of the playhouse, even when the police had tried to calm me down and tell me I was okay, that I was safe. I screamed and wailed that I couldn't leave until Mindy gave me the password, that I needed to wait for Mindy to come back. A child's brain is such a fickle thing. Once I'd heard my dad's voice, I'd forgotten about any promises sworn to Mindy and leapt out of the playhouse and into his arms, sobbing from a concoction of fear and comfort that felt oh so crushing upon the weight of my tiny shoulders. Although I was young, I wasn't stupid. I'd known what the implications of those screams were, and those sounds. I knew why I was carried out through the side gate and not through the house. I knew what the men in white overalls were doing, moving in and around the property. I knew that my participation in the Howard charade was over, and that my friend wouldn't ever come knocking on the front door of her playhouse again. Even if we wanted to, my dad and I couldn't leave. We had no money, and we were forever cursed to live next to the house of the tragedy. I started school without her, and I cried on the first day when I walked into class with an old pair of Mindy's shoes and a dress she'd given me. It never looked as nice on me as it did her. I came to learn that Mindy's grandiose tales of her popularity amongst classmates was a fairy tale. She was a nobody to them. A sad, lonely girl with no one to talk to. Perhaps that's why she'd latched on to me. Someone who had it worse, or at least, she'd thought they did. Someone she could continue to spread the plague of perfectionism passed down so unceremoniously onto her. And I wondered if her parents thought the same thing that I wouldn't be able to see the chipped paint on the walls of their home, because mine ran so much deeper. Dad and I never really spoke about it much after I turned 10, I think. Years of therapy had taught me to repress those memories, but sometimes they pulled themselves out from the back of my scalp and grasped hold in the front of my mind. I could never truly forget it. My first friend after such a traumatic time in my life and how wonderfully crafted it had all been. How I, in all my naivety and desperation, had been so blinded by gratitude that I took part in the illusion without any inkling to help her back. No one ever moved into Mindy's old home. It lay there, derelict, and as did the playhouse at the back of the garden. I must have been 16 when I decided to try my chance at hopping the fence, to go and see the playhouse up close again. It was too hard to see from my bedroom window, though I could tell it was worse for wear. It had always fascinated me, and with a bit of Dutch courage from my dad's unlocked whiskey cabinet, I clambered over, ignoring the scrapes and splinters that mottled my palms. My dad wouldn't be back for at least a few hours, so I figured I'd be in the clear, particularly since no one dared come close to the place of such a tragedy. I started to feel uneasy as I grew closer to the playhouse. It truly was decrepit. Tiles once vibrant and perfect, lay slathered in moss and slime. Grass, unkempt, grew into the cracked paint of the walls, and cobwebs glistened with moonlight. Wind whistled through the eroded adhesive of the widow sills, and the once gorgeous floral curtains were frayed and rotten. I remember my breath hitching. Perhaps I hadn't wanted to sully the wonderful memories that remained. Did I want to unearth the past that I'd so soundly put to sleep in my subconscious? I couldn't have dwelled on it too long. Before I knew it, my knuckles rapped on the small, faded green door, the password. Of course, there was no response. I almost laughed at myself. What was I thinking? That Mindy would suddenly pop out, jaw blown off and ready to pounce on me for not waiting for her, a zombie to take me to the grave for breaking our promise, and drag me down to the pits of hell? 
I started to walk away until I heard a small, meek voice. Mindy, I froze, that voice. It wasn't, a Mindy, is that you? I turned half horrified and half confused. It didn't sound like me, not how I remembered. It was too young, too small. I don't remember being that small. I knocked again the same password. Then I heard crying, soft, heartbroken sobs that rattled my brain. Mindy, please come back. I, it's me, Mindy. I couldn't stop myself. I placed a hand on the door and peered inside through the small window. I couldn't see anything but pitch, black nothingness. Can you let me in? The crying turned to some small sniffles, and after a moment, the door unlatched, creaking slightly. I pushed it open and winced from the sudden appearance of light. Despite having ducked down through the doorway, the interior of the playhouse seemed much, much larger than it did from outside. It wasn't moldy or dank, but pristine and fresh, like it had once been. The small flickers of candles danced around the room, and a warm vanilla scent danced around my nose. And nestled in the corner was a little head peeking out from under a sleeping bag, nose snotty and eyes plump and reddened with tears. Suddenly, the figure burst out from the sleeping bag and rushed toward me, wrapping arms around my torso with what felt to be relief. And Mindy, you were gone for so long. I was worried. It trailed off before looking up at me with tear-filled eyes. It was me, a much smaller, scruffier version of me. From what I could tell anyway, my mind racked with images of photographs hung on Dad's fridge. Looking at them, I don't think I'd even be able to recognize my likeness in the street. I was flabbergasted and couldn't speak. That chillingly familiar scent of vanilla candles sickened me to the point of bile rushing up my throat, and I'd known that had I dared open my mouth to respond, I'd surely expel the contents of all the whiskey I'd forced down onto the clean, carpeted floor. Carpet? I never remembered the floor to be carpeted. My eyes darted around the room, cold flooding my bones despite the cozy temperature. It wasn't exactly how I'd remembered it to be. The pristine, painted interior had chips in it, and the faux stove seemed a lot more shoddily painted. The former glory of the playhouse, despite being close to the memory I held of it, was askew, a miss, different, as if from a more grown-up lens, maturity dampening the magic that I'd conjured up in my dreams. Mindy, the small girl asked again, and she clasped my hands with her own. I looked down and saw that, unlike my tan skin that should have bore resemblance to hers, I instead had small, pale ones, fingernails painted with a light pink sheen. I quickly pulled away, grasping at my face. My nose was smaller, pointier, lips thinner. I scrambled to the window and saw Mindy, six or seven or perhaps even eight-year-old Mindy Howard, staring back at me. My face wasn't mine, it was hers. My hair was pulled back into long, blonde pigtails, and my hoodie and jeans replaced with a pink pinafore dress. I looked down at the hem of the dress and noticed a slight fraying, stitching that hadn't quite been made correctly and threatened to expose the split seam. It wasn't right. Words began to tumble out of my mouth. A voice much gentler and higher pitched than my own and didn't match the thoughts that swirled murkily in my head. My body moved on its own and I pulled the girl me her into my arms. Hey! Don't cry, everything's fine. Mommy just dropped some laundry on the ground. I spoke, Mindy spoke. The girl cried softly, and after a few moments of sniffle-broken silence, she began to calm down. I continued, Let's go to sleep now, I'm pretty tired. Mommy said she'll make us pancakes in the morning. I felt my face stretch into a small smile, and hand in hand, we moved to the sleeping bags, nestling under them together. Eventually, heavy breaths turned into light snores, and I looked at myself, her, and a warmth blossomed in my chest. And somehow, I knew. Mindy felt a genuine love for me, for the little, scruffy kid who looked at her with pure adoration. It wasn't pity, or anger, or anything else I had concocted up in my guilt-ridden stupor. She loved me, and she forgave me. And in that little, less-than-perfect playhouse, we could forget those bleak and colorless moments that loomed outside, 
and be comfortable together in our own small world of make-believe. I woke up early in the morning to water dripping from the tiles in the ceiling. Vanilla was replaced with mildew and rot, and the warmth of those sleeping bags gone, in favor of the icy, damp wooden floor. It had been stripped of everything entirely, just the shell of the playhouse standing around me. I stood up and hit my head on the ceiling, my jeans returned and hoodie sodden. I checked my cell phone, and it was 5 a.m., with the early morning sun peering through the dirted windows. Yet, despite how miserable I should have been, waking up in such a decrepit place, I was in a state of bliss, peace. I sat there for a moment, wondering if I'd been far drunker than I'd realized, and had simply passed out the moment I entered the tiny playhouse and dreamt up the entire experience. My head wasn't pounding, though at that age, hangovers felt like a slight headache, rather than severely crippling. My back did ache from the hard floor, and I felt a sense of foolishness wash over me. What was I doing, going into my deceased childhood friend's playhouse? Back to the site of the tragedy? It was only when I looked at my surroundings that I noticed the small scribbling on the floor, like chicken stretches, but blue and waxy. It was hard to read, barely legible childish scribbles. I'm sorry I couldn't come back. Thank you for being my friend. I sobbed for a very long time on the floor of that playhouse, not out of sorrow or dread. Like the last time I'd been in there, it was out of pure, absolute gratitude. I knew that, wherever Mindy was, she was finally at peace, and that rotted, tainted part of my childhood had slowly begun to repair itself, healing over like a scar that would always remain, but slowly fade. She'd saved a part of me again. A few months later, Mindy's old home was demolished. Something to do with a big buyer wanting to convert the lot into a care home. It was quite poetic in a strange sort of way. The house of the little girl who helped me would now be the home to people who needed care in the last few stages of their life. The playhouse went too, of course, but it didn't really affect me as much as I'd thought it would. I had the fond memories to go by now, and it was better to see it removed before the image of its depleted self replaced the one frozen in my mind. I have my own home now in a much nicer area. My husband and I are preparing for a new guest, a little baby girl, just six months along. My husband is quite the craftsman, and when I suggested he build a small playhouse for her, to play in with her friends when she grows up, he was delighted with the idea. I can see it now, as I'm typing this from my bedroom window. Cream painted wood, with a coral pinkish roof, clad with real tiles. Painted ivy and roses adorn the outdoors, and a duck egg green door with a sweet, heart-shaped doorknob. The windows are proper glass, and have matching green shutters on the outside. It's carpeted inside too. Story 3. I'm worried that my hometown doesn't exist. I was born in Sunset Bay, Florida, or at least I thought I was born there. I thought I was raised there, spent 17 and a half years of my life there, went to school there, had my first kiss there, and almost lost my virginity there, but now I can't even be sure. You see, as far as the world seems to be concerned, there is no such place as Sunset Bay, Florida, and there never was. Unfortunately, this story began with Hurricane Milton. As we're all well aware by now, Milton was utterly devastating for many fellow Floridians this month, and let me just say that my heart goes out to them all, well and truly. Luckily for me, though, I'd moved out of Florida with my family in 1995, just a few months before I turned 18, and I now reside in British Columbia, here in Canada. Understandably, though, when I heard that Milton made landfall in Florida, I was concerned for my hometown. I'd never been incredibly attached to Sunset Bay, and frankly, it had been years since I'd even thought of the place. I have two sons and a wife, so there are more important things in my life than reminiscing about my formative years down south. However, when I learned Milton had made a pass around near Big Cypress down by Achopi, that got my blood pumping something fierce. You see, Sunset Bay is, or was, or maybe never was, only a handful of miles away. Naturally, I hopped on my computer when I got the chance and did some searching. I looked up Hurricane Milton Sunset Bay. At first, I was relieved to find I'd come up with zero results. I figured that meant there hadn't been anything newsworthy there, 
which could have been good news in and of itself. But I was soon struck by the realization that I wasn't seeing any news about Sunset Bay because the search engine had taken the liberty of assuming I was asking about Sunset Beach down on Treasure Island. So I tried rephrasing, Hurricane Milton Sunset Bay, Florida, Achopi, but nothing. All I got was a handful of irrelevant pages on Sunset Beach, Siesta Key, and even Tampa. I was hit each time with a prompt asking me something like, did you mean Hurricane Milton Sunset Beach? I found myself like a real old man, sitting there while verbally beginning to chew out the computer. No, I would say, and oh, not Sunset Beach, Sunset Bay. I found myself getting so fed up with what I took to be some sort of Abbott and Costello-style mix-up that I ended up trying to soothe my seething self by simply typing in Sunset Bay with the hope that it'd get me somewhere. But to my shock and severe annoyance, I found myself yet again redirected to Sunset Beach. For context, Sunset Beach is a whole five or so hours from where Sunset Bay should be. They are not the same place in any sense of the word. I found myself seething even further, typing in Sunset Bay into my search bar with every sort of permutation I could think of. Sunset Bay, Sunset Bay, Florida, Sunset Bay, Florida, Florida, Sunset Bay, United States. Sunset Bay, Acobee, Florida, United States, but never got a single result. By then, I was livid, but I was also determined, determined to beat the computer, as dumb as that sounds, to get the results I was looking for. Call me stupid, call me stubborn, call the endeavor pointless. I simply wanted it to work. Once. But it never worked, not even once. Not even a hint of acknowledgement that Sunset Bay ever existed. Not even Google Maps would acknowledge its existence. Believe me, I tried. Eventually, it got to the point where I figured that the only way to get this damn thing working would be to stop looking up Sunset Bay itself and instead look up some specific place in Sunset Bay that may have some sort of website, maybe online reviews, maybe a blog post, something, anything. So I took a pause, rolled back from the desk, furrowed my brow, and got to thinking. I tried to think of where the most significant, internet-worthy place from back home might be, but the moment the neurons began firing off in my mind, I was struck with a pain so intense I can hardly even describe it. I'd imagine it felt like how it would feel if your skull was cleaved apart with an axe and then boiling pitch was poured into the gaping wound. I screamed my lungs out, grabbed my head with both hands and came careening down onto the floor, gasping and panting like a drowning man. The world felt like it was going out of focus, but my ear on the ground, I could hear the dull footsteps of my eldest son running into the room, followed shortly by my wife, as they hoisted me onto my feet as best they could. They asked me what was wrong, and why I had shouted, and I could only respond by telling them it was probably nothing, just a bad headache. Even so, my wife, who has some sort of sick addiction to these medical channels on YouTube, made me promise to see a doctor because she told me there was something called thunderclap headaches and they could be a sign of something really dangerous. Before you ask, no, I haven't gone yet, but I'm booked in for next week with my GP. To my relief, it seemed as though as soon as the subject was changed and my mind drifted back from the vague memories of my hometown, I felt good as new again, as though nothing had even happened. I gave my family reassurances as best as I could, gave my wife a quick kiss and my son a hug, and placed myself firmly back down in my chair. I was back in the saddle, and I hadn't been bested yet. Piece of shit, I murmured as I slapped the keyboard, looking up to see my wife, hand outstretched with some Tylenol for me, to whom I quickly clarified that the computer was the piece of shit, not her. She gave me a quick, understanding chuckle, and left, leaving me alone once again with my new arch-nemesis, the computer. However, it only took me a few more failed searches to get utterly fed up, and one, ah, to hell with it, later I was storming out of the room, throwing in the metaphorical towel. I had better things to do with my time, or so I thought, because that night, as I lay in bed, I found myself grumbling, huffing and puffing to myself like a candy-deprived child about the whole debacle. However, the more I ran over the whole situation in my mind, the more my frustration began to morph into unease, and the more thoughts like, why the hell couldn't I find anything about Sunset Bay? 
to why couldn't I find anything about Sunset Bay? Surely it's an abnormal occurrence for a town with a public school, thousands of residents, and several notable businesses to simply disappear not just from the map, but from the veritable neo-library of Alexandria that is the internet, right? I couldn't take it anymore. My annoyance had morphed into an overwhelming sense of dread, and I found myself in desperate need of some assurance that this was all some huge mistake. So I went digging not through the computer this time, but through an old wicker cabinet by the edge of the bed full of keepsakes and mementos. After a few moments of searching, I found what I was looking for. My middle school yearbook from Sunset Bay Public School. An incredibly creative name. Trust me, I know. To not wake my wife, I slipped away with the book back into my office, cracked it open across the desk like some sort of ancient scroll, and found my dread quickly turning to terror. There I was, my page was bookmarked, and to my right should have been Brock Tanner, but I found my greasy, pimple-pocked face next to a pale, gray square and below where the name should have been was an amorphous black smudge like the ink had been nearly rubbed out with a cloth. A misprint, maybe? I thought so, but I became less and less certain the more laminated pages I turned, finding myself faced with an ocean of gray squares and black smudges swirling into a blobby mess like a horrifying Rorschach test occasionally broken up by a calm, unbothered young face on whom the horror of this whole ordeal was understandably lost. Eyes glued to the page, I found myself fumbling for the landline, dialing the school's phone number as if from muscle memory from all those days playing hooky as a kid. It never even crossed my mind that even if this was all some huge misunderstanding, they'd certainly be closed in the dead of night. But the phone rang. It rang and rang. And then it rang again but a little softer and softer still. The quivering sounds of the line grew faint and distant, quieter still, as though the phone were being dropped down a bottomless pit, falling away until it was entirely indistinct. I nearly screamed in surprise when breaking up the dead silence. A robotic voice boomed, crackling and monotone, telling me the call was unable to be completed as dialed, before booting me out, leaving me right back where I started, eyes wild, panting in distress, fists clenched on the arms of my chair. Mackenzie, Mackenzie, I stammered to myself in a fervor now, glancing down at the face of Mackenzie Connors, one of the few remaining human buoys in the ocean of nothingness which glared back at me from the page. I went right to the computer, booted it up, and typed in Mackenzie Connors, Sunset Bay, Florida. And to my surprise and delighted relief, I was able to find what seemed to be her LinkedIn page which, while having no visible mention of Sunset Bay, did mention that she was from Florida, and she looked to be about the right build and age to be her. Once again, I failed to consider that it was the middle of the night, and may very well be wherever Mackenzie was now. But I needed this, I needed to hear someone's voice, someone from back home, I didn't even have an excuse for calling. The best I could think of was maybe something about the oddity of the yearbook, but the line connected before I could think of anything better. Hudson Tech Solutions, Mackenzie speaking, how may I help you? Hey, Mackenzie? I asked, the awkwardness of this whole situation beginning to dawn on me. Yes? How may I help you, sir? I apologize if I've got the wrong person here, but did you happen to go to school in Sunset Bay, Florida? Excuse me? Did I dash? I heard her begin before my ears were utterly assaulted by a horrifying, high-pitched scream from the phone speaker. So shrill and intense I worried it would tear the thing to bits, along with the grating sound of shattering glass. Mackenzie! I tried to remain calm, my head beginning to throb through the dullness of the painkillers. Mackenzie, are you okay? No reply. I sat wide-eyed in horror as the line seemed to briefly go dead before I could hear the sound of quiet, murmuring voices and approaching footsteps as I assume. People began to barge into her room. Hey, Mackenzie! Are you all right? One voice asked. Did someone scream? Another timidly inquired. Shit. She's on the ground. She's on the ground. A woman shrieked. Let go of the phone. Let go of the another implored feverishly before the line went dead. Leaving me in stunned silence with the dial tone buzzing in my ear. I was mortified. I couldn't do anything but set the phone down on the table. Not even the receiver and shuffle, milky-eyed back to the bedroom, whereupon I slid under the covers and shuffled up to my wife, 
as though by wrapping my arms around her I was trying to confirm to myself that I did exist and things did make sense. I wish I had more to tell you but as of now, this is where I'm at. I sincerely hope someone can help me here because I have not, for the life of me, been able to find any external references to my hometown, and every time I try and think real hard about it it feels like my head is going to implode or explode or shatter into a million pieces. Can someone please help me? Story 3. My friends and I found the secret sidewalk. Hollywood loves remakes. That's because Hollywood itself is a remake. Close your eyes and imagine a silent film. I bet you're seeing Charlie Chaplin in all of his black and white greatness. But what you might not realize is this movie you're picturing doesn't take place in Los Angeles. It's actually 350 miles north in Niles Canyon, America's first Hollywood. Niles is nestled between the base of sprawling foothills and sits at the outside edge of the San Francisco Bay's marine layer. It's a quaint little neighborhood, one that remained frozen in the era of its former glory. A classic Americana Main Street serves as an anchor to craftsmen and Victorian-style homes. At the end of Niles Boulevard is the silent film museum honoring the area's historic past life. And in the hillside that overlooks the retired train station, you'll see big white letters reading Niles. In the same style Hollywood made iconic, Niles has always been connected with something darker, though. For how small the area is, there has been a surprisingly high amount of death, mostly due to the winding one-way lane roads that run through the steep hills. Naturally, this has spawned a lot of urban legends, like the one about a girl who walks the canyon road at night asking for a ride back home to San Francisco, only to disappear before getting there. Or the tales about the white witch in the woods, and the stories about mysterious societies that meet under midnight's obscurity. Hell, there's even sightings of Charlie Chaplin's ghost. This is my personal favorite because witnesses always claim to see him in grayscale and moving at 16 frames per second. I think every town that is old enough has this kind of lore. Where I figure Niles is a bit different, though, is that it is home to the secret sidewalk. Deep in the foothills is what is known as the Secret Sidewalk, a long and mysterious stretch of cement that slithers through the hills for miles. It's hard to get to and is one of those kind of places that's passed down from one generation of young people to the next. A place that you hear your friend's older brother bragging about for years before they get too old for it and finally shows you how to get to it. Some of my favorite memories were the days my friends and I would ditch sixth period, fill a backpack with beer, and spend all day wandering the sidewalk. What the quote-unquote sidewalk actually is, is an aqueduct that used to carry water from the bay to local reservoirs. Long dried up and out of service, it now rests covered in graffiti with multiple openings pried ajar, turning the square cement structure into hollow tunnels for urban explorers or anyone brave enough to go in. I can't lie, there actually is a pretty weird feeling when you walk the sidewalk. An adrenaline boost, I don't know if it's the fact that you're legally not supposed to be there, or the suspended train track bridge you have to cross to get to it, or the silent absence of everyday bustle, but the feeling of vulnerability is palpable and hangs in the air. If you go at the right time of year, fog spills down the hill crevices like fingers reaching out for the lower canyon, adding to the eeriness of it. Earlier I said that it's what is known as the secret sidewalk. That's because it's not the real one. I know this because my friends and I regrettably found the real one a few years ago. The guys and I were far removed from our teenage youth, and to be honest, at this point we were too old to still be going there, but we were all together and feeling nostalgic. So we decided to go. We were about an hour or so into the hike and disappointingly, nothing too memorable was happening. The sidewalk was still there, as it always was but now it was without our names adorning the sides of it in bright, obnoxiously bad, spray-painted fonts. Our names now entombed under the brighter, more obnoxiously bad, spray-painted fonts of Generation Alpha and Z before them. The initial rush of adrenaline had worn off, and I forget who finally said it, but we all agreed to call it and head back. I think it was less boredom and more so that we felt a little embarrassed at how immature it all was. I mean, we were closer in age to being the people who say, aren't you a little old to be trick or treating? Than the people who were a little old to be trick or treating. So, in a collective moment of clarity, we realized that we shouldn't have been doing what we were doing. 
My friend had to piss before we left, which didn't help our immaturity rooted insecurities, but he went off to the side to handle his business regardless. We had explored the secret sidewalk at least a hundred times and felt pretty comfortable knowing our way around. I say this because my friend came back and said he saw something that he had never seen there before. Being the aforementioned stupid men that we were, we couldn't resist checking it out. Through the shrubbery, you could see what looked like a sidewalk on the other side. A real sidewalk, not an aqueduct. Overgrown and beaten, sure, but there was definitely cobble-looking stones joined together forming a walkway. We joked and named it the Super Duper Secret Sidewalk. We decided that we didn't invest years of our life exploring here to not see where it led to. We pushed the branches aside and started to walk it. Walking on this man-made structure in the middle of the wilderness felt unnatural, but the fact that it wasn't destroyed by asshole kids made it feel unexplored by anyone else. That excited us. We all were kind of giddy at the thought of actually discovering something. Usually, all you found out there was crushed natty ice cans and the occasional unwrapped condom. This was best case scenario to us because it was new and also not an unwrapped condom. Every now and then we'd actually see signs that we weren't the first to walk this path. An occasional sweater or a beanie and even a single shoe could be found laying off to the side of the sidewalk. At first, I weirdly found comfort in the discarded clothes. It made me feel less alone that someone had done this before, if that makes sense. Like, trail markers reminding you that what's ahead has been formerly walked. But the further we got, the more that feeling changed. I didn't clock it at first because of how smooth down they were, but what I originally thought was cobblestone didn't actually seem to be. It was subtle, but every now and then I'd catch it. Etched in stone were letters and numbers. They were hard to see because the stones were laid out in mosaic fashion. If you just looked at one piece, you could assume they were just scratches, but when you looked at multiple, it became clearer. We were walking on a path made of shattered headstones. At this point, I noticed that we were growing increasingly irritable. At first, I thought some of us were just tired or hangry, but it got to the point that it was what I would call irrational. Everything seemed heightened and annoying. I actually ended up snapping at one of my friends for dragging their feet and kicking up too much dust. That kind of thing never bugs me. But for some reason, it did in that moment and I couldn't help it. I wasn't the only one either. Simple bickering turned into heated arguments and deep cuts. Our innocent day of nostalgia had become a chore to get through. In retrospect, it's strange because we were clearly not feeling right, but not once did we talk about turning around and leaving like we planned to previously. Something was luring us deeper. Finally, we rounded a bend that ended up revealing the last bit of sidewalk just faded away into a big empty field. It felt incredibly anticlimactic. You know the reaction some people have when a movie cuts to black and doesn't stick the landing? The that's it kind of feeling? That's how we felt. I think one of us might have even said that out loud. We walked who knows how far and all we got was a lousy field to show for it. The hills surrounded the field, almost like a cove or a cul-de-sac. Crunchy yellow grass carpeted the ground. In the middle was one giant, lifeless tree which was weird because it was late spring after a really good rainy season. But this tree only wore rigid and empty branches. Once we shook the initial feeling of disappointment, we noticed what looked like pieces of old wood strewn about. Not like fallen branches, but more so resembling posts or panels. We felt obligated at this point to investigate it. As soon as we stepped off the path, the air changed. Almost a subtle pressurized feeling. The wood was clearly from some sort of shelter structure. I couldn't tell if it was enough to be a house or a hut, but it looked extremely weathered and almost half of the pieces were charred. My friends were trying to puzzle the wood back together, but I couldn't look away from the tree. One branch in particular. I can't explain why I was drawn to it. I was standing right under it and almost transfixed. The harder I looked, the more I could hear a sound coming from it which didn't make sense because it wasn't a windy day, the tree wasn't visibly moving, but I could 100% hear a sound, like a back and forth type of sound, like a swaying that was speaking to me. A minute or an hour could have passed and I wouldn't have known. I lost track. I was so locked onto the tree, 
that I hadn't even noticed my friends heading back to the trail. I don't know if I ever would have noticed, if not for their voices calling my name. When I looked at them, I saw each one of their faces slowly morph into a confused worry. They weren't looking at me but around me. Like when you're talking to someone and they're looking just above your eye or something. It didn't seem like any of them were looking at the same thing either. I followed eye lines and couldn't figure out what they were looking at. There wasn't anything there. I rejoined the group and no one said a word. I asked what they were looking at and I couldn't get a straight answer from anyone. It was all I don't know s and nothing s. I don't think anyone wanted to sound like the crazy one. So, like every other expedition we had ever completed, we just left very unceremoniously. Just headed back to back to our everyday lives like nothing happened. Before getting too far, I felt the sudden urge to sneak one last peek at the field. I can't say for sure what it was, but I know that I saw something. I think we all did in our own way. To me, it looked like a fuzzy black shadow with two piercing reflective eye-like dots, like three-dimensional shape TV static or a dark smudge on a pair of glasses, almost like a translucent Rorschach test. You could probably draw any conclusion that you wanted to as to what you were seeing. I still haven't quite figured it out. What I do know is that something was under that tree when I looked back. I know that much. I don't know exactly what it was, but I don't believe that it was of this world. Before the silent film era took over Niles, the land was home to Spanish missions and the Ohlone tribe. So who knows what kind of unfortunate entities are bloodbound to those hills. My friends and I never really talked about that day ever again. I tried, but it was like pulling teeth. Every now and then I'd get a crumb of what someone saw or a retelling of what a friend told another friend they saw. Oddly, it didn't seem like any of us had the same experience. No one else saw the single figure under the tree like I did. Some even said they saw multiple silhouettes. Two big ones off to the side or a big one and a couple of small ones linked together or groups of them clashing. None if it made sense to me. How could we all share a completely different experience of the same thing? I should have known something was wrong though because we are a reminiscing kind of group. We never hesitated to tell a story we've told or heard a thousand times. But a hidden sidewalk and strange figures in a field didn't warrant at least a couple million retellings? It never sat right with me. Our friendships weren't the same afterward. Slowly, we stopped hanging out as much and talked even less. No one ever tried to give a reason as to why, either. We just accepted it as the way life moves. Friends got married, started families, chased careers, and had less and less time for each other until our friendships dwindled. One by one, my friends started to move away. One to Texas, another to Minnesota, one went to Idaho, and one even landed in Hollywood. I believe the field pulled us there. Some days I could feel it pulling me back. I'm sure they felt it too. I wouldn't know because they never talked to me about it. When they started moving away, it always seemed like they were trying to get as far away from it as they could. Like they were trying to escape something. I didn't. I'm still here. And most days when I'm feeling lonely and miss my best friends, I try to replay my favorite memories of them in my head. But now when I do, I don't hear my friends anymore. All I'm able to hear is the slow, back and forth, creaking of that tree branch. Story 4. Resonance. Trapidoine 2024. The bass thudded through my bones, and the lights pulsed like a heartbeat. At first, everything felt normal. Just another rave in an abandoned warehouse, the kind of night I'd been to dozens of times before. My friends and I had come in a pack, laughing and shouting over the music, but they drifted off into the crowd hours ago. I tried to follow them at first, but everyone seemed to melt together in the shifting lights, and I found myself alone. It was fine. I didn't mind being the sober one for once, taking it all in. Besides, it was actually kind of interesting watching everyone in their states of euphoria, moving to the beat like they were all part of some strange ritual. But as the night went on, things started to feel off. There was a guy stumbling past me, his eyes wild, his mouth stretched in a strange, open-mouthed grin. He muttered something under his breath, words that sounded half-formed, like he was speaking in fragments. I couldn't catch what he was saying, but it made the hairs on my arms stand up. As I moved deeper into the warehouse, a girl caught my eye, 
dancing wildly, her movements almost manic. She was facing me, her eyes locked on mine. At first, I thought it was just a coincidence, but as I tried to look away, she kept staring. No matter where I went in the room, her eyes followed me, huge and black, swallowing the light. Felt like she was peering right through me. My phone buzzed. I pulled it out, hoping maybe one of my friends was trying to find me. But when I looked, the screen showed a message from an unknown number. Leave now. A chill ran down my spine. I quickly typed back. Who is this? No response. I shoved the phone back into my pocket, glancing around. The party had felt so alive, but now, there was something wrong. People weren't dancing the same way anymore. They were swaying, yes, but slower, almost mechanical. The music seemed to thump in time with their movements, like they were all part of some synchronized nightmare. Then the crowd parted slightly, and I saw someone collapse onto the floor. No one noticed. They just kept moving, stepping around him as he lay there, his mouth opening and closing in a silent whisper. I felt an urge to help him, so I crouched beside him. Hey, are you okay? I asked, hoping he'd respond. He didn't look at me, just kept whispering. But as I leaned closer, I could just make out his words. Eyes, they're watching us. A surge of dread washed over me. I stumbled back, my heart pounding as I scanned the room. Faces everywhere, slack and staring, people moving like puppets, but their eyes, the eyes were wrong. Too wide, too dark, too knowing. Then, the music stopped, cutting out mid-beat, and a voice crackled through the speakers. Smooth, calm, and eerily cheerful. Thank you all for coming to our experiment. You were the perfect subjects. My stomach twisted. Experiment, the people around me, all of them staring blankly, twitching and whispering in eerie unison. The sound was low, almost like chanting, filling the space in a way that clawed at my sanity. I felt trapped, boxed in by their glassy-eyed faces, each one as blank as the next. Frantically, I yanked out my phone, ready to call for help. But before I could open the screen, another message popped up. You were never meant to leave. I stared at the words, my breath catching in my throat. Then, the realization hit me the message was from my own number. I felt the walls closing in, the locked warehouse doors towering over me like prison bars, and the people, those empty, staring people, started moving toward me, closing the gap between us. My own reflection in the phone screen looked just as empty as theirs, and with a sinking heart, I knew what they all did. They'd let themselves go given themselves over completely to whatever this experiment was. Whatever they'd taken, whatever trance they were in, it was more than just a high. They weren't just intoxicated or altered. They were part of something larger, something that had taken their minds and stripped them down to empty vessels. I realized with dawning horror that they weren't just staring. They were waiting, waiting for me. The people around me weren't just random ravers lost in a drug-fueled haze. They were participants, willing or not, in some kind of horrific psychological test. And now that I was fully aware, fully sober, I understood. I was the final subject, the last one resisting. All of them had given in, one by one, until I was the only mind left that was still my own. I looked back down at my phone, at the message from my own number. You were never meant to leave. My heart hammered as the crowd closed in, their blank faces contorting into something almost expectant. I realized they weren't just a part of the experiment. They were the experiment. And in this moment, as their empty eyes bore into me, I understood their final test. The voice crackled back over the speakers, almost soothingly. Will you join them, or will you resist? The choice was mine, but so was the price. I could let myself fall into the same mindless rhythm as them, surrendering whatever control I had left or I could resist and become a target, the last thread to be cut. And as the crowd pressed closer, chanting softly in unison, I felt the terrifying weight of that decision. I realized they hadn't let themselves go. They'd been taken. And if I didn't find a way out, they would take me too. The crowd pressed closer, their faces twisted with expectation, their whispers rising, forming a single, 
chilling phrase, join us, join us, join us. I stumbled back, desperate, eyes darting toward the locked doors, the blackened windows, any possible escape. But there was nowhere to go. They were all around me, a wall of empty faces and twitching bodies, closing in, pressing against me like a human vice. Their eyes, glassy and dark, were now fixed on me, drilling into my mind, and I felt my own sense of self start to slip under the weight of their gaze. Will you join them, or will you resist? The voice repeated over the speakers, calm, even amused. It was as if it already knew my answer. My hands shook as I looked down at my phone, the final message from my own number glowing up at me. You were never meant to leave. The words flickered and blurred on the screen, twisting into a new message. Welcome to the experiment. In that instant, a chilling realization hit me. I hadn't just wandered into a trap. I was its centerpiece. The experiment was about breaking minds, stripping them down to nothingness, one by one. I was the last one left to break, the last subject to lose myself to the darkness that had consumed everyone else. And now, they were waiting for me to give in. Suddenly, I felt an icy chill creep up my spine, and a strange fog settled over my mind. My thoughts dulled, and my heartbeat slowed, sinking with the bass that thrummed through the walls, into my veins, into my brain. The whispers grew louder, drowning out everything else until they were all I could hear. Join us, join us, join us. I tried to resist, to cling to my last shred of sanity, but it was slipping like water through my fingers. I could feel myself fading, my sense of self dissolving into the darkness, joining the void that surrounded me. And then, finally, I felt it, that terrifying surrender. My mind fractured, split, and all I could see were their faces, their empty, expectant faces, welcoming me into the dark. The last thing I heard before my own voice joined the whispers was that calm, eerie voice over the speakers, its words sealing my fate. Thank you for participating. The experiment is complete. Story 5 We went too deep. One of the weirder things I fantasize about is handling the deaths of people I care about. Like, when one of my aunts was very ill, I imagined the extremely moving eulogy I could deliver. I would talk about the meaning she had in our lives, what made her special and unique, and everyone would cry and laugh. In a way, I hate that I do this because I don't want these people to die. But there's a chance they will. I guess I want to be prepared so I can help others handle the deaths too. I can be that comfort for everyone in those times and I feel a little pride in that. When I got with my girlfriend Tracy, I imagined being a support to her when her grandfather passed away. She was close to him. Without a father in her life, he had brought that stability. He was now in his eights, having a lot of trouble with his heart, and every day there was a sense of, today could be the day. I didn't want anything to happen to him. I hoped he'd live another decade if possible. Yet I thought a lot about the ways in which I could be there to get her through it when he did. It's kind of a hero fantasy. It's also kind of a planning fantasy. Like when you imagine how you'd escape a building if a crazed shooter showed up. You imagine the places you'd hide, exits you'd take. Or you think about how you'd sneak and conceal your identity to steal something you want to steal from a store or home. All of my fantasizing put me in a good place to jump into action when we got the news that Grandpa Terry was on his deathbed. It was a matter of days. He was coming in and out of consciousness. During his lucid moments he was talking and seemed in good spirits, they said. I barely knew Grandpa Terry. He'd been sick for years before I got with Tracy. She introduced me to him when we drove upstate once. He was a nice man. He still smoked cigars. He used to work in the jukebox business. Before he met Tracy's grandmother, he used to live with two women. He also claimed he got in a fistfight with Harry Belafonte. So Grandpa Terry was cool from what I saw. But I must have been just background noise to him, some guy dating his granddaughter for three months. When we got to the hospital, the fifth floor where they put folks who are expected to die, we found Tracy's entire family had gathered. Some I'd met and some had come from all over the country to give their farewell. Bringing in coffee pots and donuts to stay as long as they needed to stay, 
They'd practically taken over the sitting room on the floor. Tracy asked her mother what was going on. They were speaking in whispers, but I overheard bits, enough to get the idea. He had spoken to everyone as a group and now just wanted some peace. He had had the nurse bring his brother in for a one-on-one -on -one chat and his oldest daughter. That was it. Everyone had to wait outside ever since. I was stroking Tracy's hair and letting her talk about her feelings when the nurse stepped out again. As she walked down the hallway, every family member's head raised or swiveled to her, as if wondering if they would be the chosen one to receive Grandpa Terry's last words. She walked past them all to me and Tracy. I tapped Tracy gently and smiled at her. But the nurse looked at me and said, He wants to talk to you. I explained to her that I wasn't family and she had me mixed up with someone else. Tracy was readily agreeing with me and looking around for who I could possibly have been mistaken for. You're Douglas? The nurse asked. When she saw me nod, she added, Come along. I followed her sure that she was making a mistake and I would have to come awkwardly walking back out in a few seconds. I saw the family members staring at me with incredulity and maybe resentment. If it wasn't a mistake, then I assumed I would be getting threatened with haunting if I didn't treat Tracy right. The nurse opened the door slightly, enough to allow me to squeeze in, then entered behind me shutting the door. Inside, Grandpa Terry was propped up in bed wearing a fancy, red smoking jacket. He had a strange look about him. His skin seemed stiff and his eyes an empty black. He was like a wax figure of himself or ventriloquist's dummy. His feet stuck straight up in their hard-soled slippers. Other than his eyes and his mouth, his body didn't move. It was just dressed and propped there. Douglas, he said in clear but weakened voice, have a seat. Well, now I knew it was me he wanted, at least. Douglas, I've been wanting to talk to you about your ASMR videos. Of all the things he could have said to me at that moment, that wasn't even on the radar. For one, I don't talk about my ASMR videos. I didn't want anybody knowing. I hadn't even told Tracy or my friends. So how did he know about them? Two, how did this old man who still had a landline phone and used a typewriter to send letters know about ASMR videos at all? Yes, sir, was what I managed to say. They make me feel strange things, Douglas. What do you mean? I asked. Your ASMR videos make me feel strange things, Douglas. Things I'm not supposed to feel. I'm scared of these strange things I'm feeling watching your videos, Douglas. I looked over to the nurse to see if she would intervene or explain. The nurse stood impassively in the corner of the room with a towel over one arm. She resembled more a bathroom attendant. Her presence unnerved me further. Yes, I talked to the nurse about ASMR, and she has told me that I am supposed to feel a pleasant tingling sensation that starts at my scalp. When I watch your ASMR videos, I don't feel a pleasant tingling sensation that starts at my scalp. When I watch your ASMR videos, I feel strange things I can't explain or describe. Like that feeling when you say a word so many times it doesn't sound like the right word anymore. But about everything. Worse and stranger. These are strange things, Douglas, strange things to feel. They make me afraid. I'm sorry, I said. I'm not supposed to feel these strange things watching your videos, Douglas. I'm not supposed to feel these strange things ever, I don't think. I'm not supposed to have these feelings. Your ASMR videos make me remember things I haven't remembered since I was a little boy. It has been so long since I remembered these things. I only know their memories because it's all so familiar. If they aren't memories, how can it feel like I've been there? If they aren't memories, how are these places in my head? These places and things I remember give me those strange feelings, Douglas. The nurse still stood with the towel saying nothing. I didn't like the things Grandpa was saying and I didn't like that I had no support in this room from the only professional. I don't think I can help you, sir, I answered. Maybe just watch someone else's videos? No, you did something in those videos to make me feel strange things. Why? What did you do? I stood up to leave. I felt at this point I should get the family involved. I was only agitating a poor, dying man. This man had fist-fought Harry Belafonte. He shouldn't be arguing with me about ASMR videos. I need to go further in, he said. Your videos take me part of the way, to where I'm slipping between, a bit awake and a bit asleep. 
That's when these memories and strange feelings come down. The sudden, like my head nodding as I'm falling asleep. Just like when my head nods, it makes me snap back out. I lose it. It's just a hazy impression. I need to go further in, Douglas. I don't have much longer. If I die now, if I die without going in, I need you to do your ASMR to help me. There was a knock on the door. I heard Tracy asking, Is everything okay in there? The nurse sprang like a bear trap, darting across the 12 feet or so to the door and announced, Everything is fine, ma'am. Please don't disturb the patient any further. I heard a stifled sob, I think, but there were no further disturbances. The nurse remained at the door, effectively blocking me if I tried to escape. I can show you my other videos. Sure, but wouldn't you rather spend your last moments with your family? They're out there. I know, Douglas, I know, he said in an agonized voice, but I can't do that until I understand. I pulled out my phone and was getting YouTube up when he said, come over here and pretend you're applying makeup on me. There's a makeup kit in the drawer there. The nurse got it. I walked over to the stand he was pointing out. In the drawer, I found a compact with some different eyeshadow colors, foundation in a few skin tones, blush and bronze, two different sizes of brush, some eyebrow pencils, mascara and lipstick in the shade Pina Colada. Take me further in, Douglas, Grandpa Terry said. I felt really weird about this. I felt trapped because it seemed like this was a man's dying wish. But it's like he had this planned. How did he know I would even be here? Tracy asked me at the last minute. She said she had intended to go with her sister. How long had he been waiting for this? Plus, he was an old man who had done manly stuff all his life. I didn't want to pretend to apply makeup on him. It was weird. Maybe I should just do a fake eye exam or... Just bring that stuff over here, set it on my belly and start, he said, his patience clearly wearing thin. I did as he asked, loading up the items and setting them gently on the old man's smoking jacket. I looked over to the nurse at the door to see if she was watching me. She was still facing the door. The old man looked up at me expectantly. It was like someone asking you to sing in front of them when you just don't do that. Let me see what we got here first, I said. This was something I like to do in my videos. Take my time, handle objects, examine them. Some folks get the tingles from that. Grandpa nodded. Got some nice colors in here, I said. To myself, about the eyeshadow set, I started reading off some of the color names. On I went, examining each item, reading off ingredients, muttering this and that. Then I told him I would start with applying a foundation layer. I think he'd entered some kind of trance. He seemed to be looking through me. I'm in a strange town, an older part of town, wrong side of the don't stop, please. I was so shocked to hear him start speaking. I had stopped what I was doing to listen. I went back to pretending to apply foundation to Grandpa Terry and explaining how important it is to get a nice, even coat. I don't know if that's true. With ASMR, reality doesn't matter. Let me ramble. I'll ramble and you roleplay. Yes, I know this place, where the concrete is crumbling under an abandoned overpass and along the old off-ramp a little shop. What is this shop? It's so late, why is it still open? Who comes to this place? The images of the place he described rose vividly into my mind like long-forgotten memories. Vivid, yet strange, disconnected from the vast body of memories that form my regular biography. I must have seen this place somewhere before felt so familiar. What was this place he was describing? I didn't like this. I was getting nervous. But I got out the eyebrow pencil and kept making motions in front of the entranced face. The inside has a nice wood flooring. Unusual flooring for this place. Merchandise placed tidily on shelves. What are they selling? What is this merchandise? There are a few customers inside looking at the at merchandise. A woman is behind the counter. Nobody notices me. They aren't right. Is this a memory? I feel like I can move. Move on my own. There's a dark corner with something valuable. I should go to it. Make me go further, Douglas. I laid it on thick, making swish sounds with my mouth as I swiped with the eyebrow pencil and murmuring to myself. 
I leaned in closer to his ear and said something about eyebrows. Douglas, he shouted, his voice tinged with chilling levels of alarm. They see me now. Oh no, oh no, I can't go. I mustn't he move. Oh God, they're all looking at me. I tried to tell him he's fine and safe, but he continued, What is this place? They say I shouldn't be here. Douglas, they heard you too. They can see you. How? Douglas, stop moving. Stop for the love of God. I stopped instantly. I felt a cold shiver. Nothing like ASMR. Run through me. My foreboding had culminated dread. What Grandpa described felt real. I can't explain it, but I could almost see it. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. He blurted in panic. Douglas, help me get out of here. I can't get out. Help. They're mad at us. More makeup. I looked to the nurse hoping she would inject him with a sedative. He clawed the air for my help. I hastily pretended to apply lipstick to him, making little pop sounds with my mouth and feeling stupid the whole time. I'm at a high rise now, Grandpa Terry said, much calmer now. It's being converted to apartments. There's a crane machine far away. Nobody's here. It's brown. I take an elevator up to a high up floor, but not the top. It's the 35th floor, isn't it? I asked on impulse. I remembered this place too. I don't remember remembering it before just then, but I was sure I'd seen it. I feel strange, Grandpa Terry said. Me too, I said. We should stop. No. Please. I need to go further in. Please. With a sigh, I started swishing eye shadow. There's no way we could both have vague, distant memories of these very particular places. I'd had dreams of this place. Glimpses somehow. I felt like we were messing with something we shouldn't be. Yet I continued. This floor is unfinished. I enter one of the apartments, 26, to look around. Windows haven't been installed. Plastic sheeting blows inward. It's so dark in here. It's a long apartment. One long hallway with a few little rooms. Modern. Down that one way there's the bathroom, I think. I need to use the bathroom. This room's closed. The door is closed. I felt a wave of dread that made my limbs weak. I fumbled the eyeshadow, dropping it on Grandpa Terry making a dusty mess on his smoking jacket. I expected him to yell at me but he didn't seem to notice. I grabbed the mascara and made some swishes. Someone's on the other side of this door, he said. Grandpa made a long E sound that chilled my blood. Someone's in there, he half squealed, half whispered. I'm sure of it. I feel someone on the other side of the door waiting. They've been waiting. It wants to harm me. It wants us to open the door. To harm us. It knows we're here. They know what I'm saying and what we're thinking. The person on the other side of the door knows things. It wants to hurt us real bad. I had started shaking Grandpa Terry to snap him out of it. I hoped he was crazy, but I was trembling and deeply disturbed by what he was saying. This place was real. We shouldn't be doing this, Douglas. I was wrong. We're in danger. I'm not doing this anymore. I shouted. No more ASMR. Snap out of it. I didn't even care if his family heard and came running. I just wanted him to knock it off. Nobody did come running, though. Even the nurse just kept her post at the door. I'll walk away and maybe it'll stay there in that closed room. Just stay there forever waiting. Maybe it can't open the door. Maybe they'll just stand there for all time. Just like before. No, they won't wait much longer. I need to go. Come on. Drop it, old man. You're freaking me out. I shouted. It knews. It knows we're right here. It won't let me just go. It's gonna come out. It's something from outside. Help me get out. Douglas, more ASMR, cranial nerve exam, quick. This is insane, I said. I won't. Grandpa Terry's eyes opened wide and he started to scream. Blood formed in the corner of his eyes. I looked to the nurse and demanded she help him. She handed me a stethoscope and a pen. I was desperate and maybe she knew something, I don't know, medical benefits of ASMR. I did it. I started moving the pen around in the air asking him to follow it with his eyes. Oh, thank God. He sighed and I could feel it too. We had transitioned somewhere else. I'm not sure how I knew, but I knew. We're in a department store, he said. After hours, 
So dark in here. I haven't been here since I was a kid, but it's different now. Deeper. How to get deeper. There are still people here shopping. Oh, oh no. They're all here. Have to keep going. I moved my fingers in and out of his view frame, pretending he was telling me, Stop. When he saw my fingers and telling him, Good. I struggled to do this while my hands shook and I felt sick inside. I knew this place. I'd seen it. I'd been there as a kid too and I dreamed of it. It had gotten deeper. It was a bad place. He had to get outside quick. I'm going to go outside, have to get outside. It's at the far end. The deepest. Good. I said, good. Now sharp or dull. I found the doors. He announced after minutes of quiet panic. I'm going out into the parking lot so dark. A few cars in the dark and street lights. Nothing beyond. Dark everywhere. Some grasses and a gas station far, far away. Not really there. We made a mistake, Douglas. They're out. They're coming out. They know they see you looking at you through me those cold, empty eyes. These weren't memories. I threw the stethoscope against the wall. I began making as many loud, obnoxious noises as I could. Hitting the metal frame of the bed. Coughing. Anti-SMR sounds. I heard the door open. I expected the family to come charging in wondering what I was doing to the family patriarch. In fact, the sound was just the nurse leaving. She gingerly shut the door behind her. When I turned back, Grandpa Terry was dead. His eyes were frozen in terror. Trickles of blood ran from the corners and from his ears. I backed to the door and left the room. I had to go tell this family now that Grandpa Terry died while I, practically a stranger, spent his last moments, but I didn't have to. Nobody was there. His family had just left. It was inexplicable. Where had they gone? Where was the nurse? I checked the sitting room. Nobody was there. Just the boxes of donuts and tanks of coffee. I asked at the desk and nobody knew what I was talking about. All they cared about was one of their patients was now dead. I texted Tracy to let her know her beloved grandfather had just passed while she wandered off. She never answered. She never returned my calls. Ever. She disappeared from my life. From everything, social media, all of it. She was just gone. I never saw or heard from her or her family again. I couldn't understand it. I stopped making ASMR videos after that. I haven't stopped watching them, though. Sometimes I dream of these places still. Places like the ones Grandpa Terry described. But it's okay. He was right, the videos aren't enough to get deep. I keep feeling like, maybe someday I'll see the old man in there and sometimes I think I feel him just around the corner, but deeper and I feel a warning that we went too deep. 